it takes a lifetime to learn how to die. But some people will get to that point and, and never have worked out how to live in the first place. If you spend in your whole time worrying about what other people think or scared of shit or fucking believing the news or whatever it is, like, and you ain't living. If you spend your time worrying about what's happened coming up in the future or regretting things that happened in the past, you ain't living. It takes a long time to work out, like, to learn how to exist in the moment and actually live. Akira the Don, globally renowned artist and DJ and creator of Meaning Wave Universe. Akira the Don, thank you for joining me on the Freedom Pack podcast. Yo, pound out. <laughs> I've, I got you on the show because a while ago, my co-host and I, uh, we were talking about the power of music. We were discussing, just trying to have a chat about why it seems to affect our lives so much. And it made me think back to these videos and these songs of yours I would listen to. Of, I was big into your stuff with Alan Watts. I thought that was fantastic. And, and so I wanted to get you on the show to explore the theme. So I guess my first question is, is on the power of music. What is it about music that it just seems to, it can affect our mood, it can affect our motivation, it can affect our passions. It just seems so powerful. Why do you think that is? Well, it's- there's a lot, <laughs> there's so much to unpack in that. And it's something that we don't even fully understand as a species yet, or even come close to understanding. Uh, one way of thinking about it is that music communicates things that words cannot. Uh, Terence McKenna always talked about uh, our language being unfinished, right? And, uh, and you know, m- many people have spoken about this. The language that we have, doesn't matter what language you're using, whether it's English or Spanish or whatever, Uh, doesn't come close to describing that which we experience. And that which we experience does not come close to that which is. Uh, You know, so there's these like multiple Russian doll levels of of the reality that we experience, the reality that we kind of uh, intuit, perhaps, the reality that we can explain, the reality that we can, uh, you know, hammer down into, into phrases or hieroglyphs. And music can communicate things that the words and pictures cannot. So that's one thing music does. Uh, You know, you ever try watching a movie with the sound off? You know, it's a completely different thing. If you're watching a movie and you start crying like 9.9 times out of 10, it's because the music has has, uh, a... I wouldn't say manipulated you kind of it's kind of emotionally manipulated you into that state of being so that uh you know then receiving the picture with the music you will you will burst into tears and you wonder why Mm. you know music is far more powerful than we even understand and and then if you want to break it down into like why that might be there's uh you know the frequencies that everything is made of uh seem to dovetail and interweave with those frequencies of, of music uh, in a way that the sort of clumsy uh, shapes that come about, out of our faces to try and describe things do not, you know, and you could really get in harmony with music and you really can get in harmony with the, you know, fundamental uh, building blocks of the universe. And, you know, say you were talking, mentioned Alan Watts, you talk about this a lot, right, that life is really, uh, you know, his idea about life not being a journey, you know, that people have this idea that life is a journey and it's like, right, I've got to get from here to here and I've got to get to school, then the end of school, then the job, then the promotion, and then the da 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 and then you get to the end and then you're like, oh, well, wait a minute. When in fact you were supposed to be engaged in the thing as it was happening. The idea being that rather than a journey or a mission, it's more of a dance, more of a song. And you were supposed to be dancing. You were supposed to be harmoniously interacting uh, with with the with the thing as you went along, you know. And again, there's music. Uh, you know, one could go on forever about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a former guest of this show um, in Dave Rubin that mm. I watched a video of him speaking to Jordan Peterson. I think this is when they reference um, your work. And Jordan says that music is literally one of the things that keeps people alive. Yes. Do you believe that to be the case? 
well, I've known it to be true in my own life and I've seen it to be the case in many other li- li- in the lives of people I've met and I receive communications on a daily basis from people telling me the same thing. And it's uh, really is quite the bloody thing uh, getting messages on a daily basis from people saying they were, they were going to kill themselves or like they were, you know, they had various problems and music is what got them through it. And this is literally every day. And it's just ridiculous things. Like I was addicted to heroin and this music helped me get off that. I was going to kill myself. I had a friend who was in this situation. Or oh, then down to this gave me the uh, the energy or whatever it was to make it through the deadlift. I was kind of scared of or whatever it was. Uh, you know, David Goggin says music is cheesing. <laughs> you know, and normally you'd say that about like, you know, steroids or something, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's how powerful music is, that a certain kind of mindset could consider it cheating to engage music with the activity. Uh, And then, you know, Goggins, he, you know, he used music, didn't he, when he did his famous uh, 24-hour, I think it was, pull-up marathon. Uh, He was listening to the Rocky theme on the loop. Wow. You know? Incredible, yeah, man. I I agree with everything you say there. And as we watch it, if anyone's watching this video, they can see on the quite retro television behind you, um, meaning wave. Can you def- just define what that means? Oh, wow, so, there we are. <laughs> this is how I'd be making my visuals and shit. So I'm in, uh, <laughs> I'm in Mexico right now. I've got a portable studio set up, but one critical aspect of, of my creation process is having an old CRT television, which is amusing that that's what they're called. <laughs> and... Uh, and a circuit bust up box and running things through it. Um, sorry, Amy, what was your question? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you started there. Can you just sort of define to our audience who may be completely unaware of the genre that you seem oh, right. to have yeah, created? Yeah, yeah. What is Meaning Wave? Yeah, well, Meaning Wave is um, it's a psycho, it's one part psychotechnology and one part epic story. So I was a little kid, my favorite thing is when I was like my son's age and younger. Basically, I don't remember mu- not much before seven, but I remember seven. And when I was seven, I was really into music and comic books. And so what music and what Meaning Wave is doing is harnessing the power of music that I discovered from very early. Like I quit school when I was 16, but like the last education I did, the exams, the only, uh, the only, what do you call it? Revision. <laughs> I did was reading my notes over ambient music and then playing them when I went to sleep. Mm. And I did very well because I recognized very early, I'll combine words with music and you can, that will drill into you. Uh, just, just integrate music with words and you can easier. And, you know, I knew from very early the way, the way that poetry would work to make you remember things. And if you make something rhyme, you're going to remember it and share that nature. Always known that. And then I always loved comic books. And what I always loved about comic books was the sort of mythopoetic epic story that never ends, right? And the purpose of mythology is to encode uh, the knowledge of the society in a really, really, really heavily condensed format that you can give to the child or whatever, and they will understand where the fuck they are in the context of the society, right? Mm -hmm. So you show a kid sort of Star Wars or whatever the fuck it is, and the kid should kind of have an idea of his place in the world and how the world operates and what these various, you know, aspects to life are he's supposed to go on a journey at some point he's gonna have to let go of his childhood blah, 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 all this type of things right so meaning wave uh is basically me working out uh i've been making these like rap records and i was making a trilogy of albums about the kind of uh, the human state of existence and the first one was very easy it was about being a kid and uh being an individual so coming into the world and being an individual and i had these samples from the prisoner that tv show I'm not a number, I'm a free man, whatever. And, uh, you know, so the first stage of life, you come in and you realize you're this individual in the world and the world's trying to sort of like smash that out, you know? Second album was the life equation. That was about when you realize that you are a part of something and you are interfacing with all this other stuff. And that's what happens as you become sort of, you know, you leave childhood and you get into young adulthood, you know? Then I was going to make the third album. Then I realized I wasn't smart enough yet and I hadn't lived enough yet. So I had to go off and have a kid and all this type of shit. And then I realized I was making all these beats and I was listening to lectures over the top of them while I was making beats. I'd have, you know, Alan Watts, Jordan Peterson, whatever the fuck it was, Robert Hansen Wilson on 
I was like, this shit is fly. And I'd made loads of records like that before on mixtapes. I've been doing that since like 2000. I'd make rap records would have a, uh, a skit on them, right? You'd have like three or four seconds of a bit of a movie or something. Yeah. But in my mixtapes, I would have a whole song that would be uh, Jack Kirby talking about how he created Galactus in the Marvel Universe or something. So I just ended up, I just made more of those and, and it, people liked it. And then I realized, oh shit, I don't have to, know everything there's a guy over there who's thought about this one thing for 40 years i could make a record with his voice and thoughts that would integrate all that knowledge into pop songs and then it becomes like neo in the matrix and that i know kung fu thing it's like you can mm -hmm. download you can basically download a guy's uh knowledge in the context of an album and you can listen to that shit a thousand times right you can listen to a podcast once or twice you can listen to a pop song a thousand times you don't have to understand it you could listen to it and then, and I get people writing to me all the time saying this, they're like, oh, I've been listening to that one Alan Watts record of yours for two years. And I just worked out what it meant because something happened in their life, but like, they just like the song. So they'd listen yeah. to it, you know? Uh, so anyway, so yeah. So Mini Wave was like, I worked out uh, that I could integrate all these ideas uh, and things into music. And then there was all the, there's kind of the story of mankind as I saw it in a mythopoetic fashion. I realized all these different people have the keys and I could structure it like a, a comic book universe. I could structure it like Stan Lee and Jack Kirby did the Marvel universe. And I could build, uh, you know, on this foundational level and then build out. And you start with the kind of down to earth stuff, a bit like the Marvel universe uh, in the MCU started with Iron Man, right? Because you could kind of believe that existed in our world. You could go, okay, a super smart, super rich guy in a cave could maybe cobble together a, a suit of armor. That's And then over the course of, you know, 10 years, you can get into, into Doctor Strange in space. And I figure, okay, so I can start with, say, Jordan Peterson, and then we can move our way up to Terrence McKenna and mm. Robert Hansen Wilson and Graham Hancock and, and, you know, whoever it is. And at the same time, it's very important for me to be very, very practical. So for every kind of record that, that I do, it's Alan Watts contemplating the nature of reality. And then I'll have Jordan Peterson looking at the same problem from the other side of the room. But then I'll do something very practical with, say, Scott Adams kind of showing you how to, uh, you know, use these things as a framework for navigating the world in a practical fashion. You know, or I'll have Jocko willing kind of motivating you to get out of bed in the morning. Or I'll have Joe Rogan explaining how you can integrate these things. It's just like a way of getting, th you know, getting through... Uh, not accepting the base level life they want for you or so on and so forth you know so yeah mythopoetic uh, story combined with the psychotechnology and psychotechnology basically is just is the music plus words aspect of it so i wonder if you could speak on maybe the the sort of creative process behind it because i wonder is there a science in this in the sense that there's certain metrics maybe you use to determine what emotions of the lectures to attach to, you know, certain types of musical vibes, or is it more of a just natural thing that comes natural to you? This, but there is a science to it, but I don't think of it in those terms. It's one of those yeah. things that kind of reverse engineered. I'll be like, oh, okay, so that as you like, you're a DJ. Well, I'm a DJ. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're I'm a not DJ. A DJ. <laughs> definitely. When not. you DJ, and I would definitely, I would always advise people should try it because I think anybody can do it. Uh, the, the important thing about DJing is not the equipment, it's just the music. And it's mm. a thing you can just sort of try. Okay, what happens if I play this song? People run away. What happens if I play this song? People seem to like this song. What happens if I play this song and this song? Oh, they all start fighting. What happens if I play this song? Oh, they all start like humping each other. Oh, that's interesting. You know, so you DJ long enough, you start to notice that combinations of music do certain things and people are very, very easily programmable with music, you know? Uh, so, like, say you're structuring an album and it's like, okay, this bit's gonna evoke this and this bit is to do that and this bit is, you know, you can kind of use the same principles. But I very much do this stuff kind of naturally and I don't, I was going to say I don't overthink, but I just don't think. And like since I started Meaning Wave, not long after I made the first record, it's nearly four years, by the way. July 2nd is the four year anniversary of the first Meaning Wave song, which was Be a Plumber. Um, yes. But, and that was, yeah, it wasn't long after that that I sort of started the hyper productivity experiment. Um, 
and zone in habitation experiment where it's like you know you make music or whatever you do you lift weights cook you find yourself sometimes in the zone right and that's you know the magical place where everything flows and you don't really have to think and in fact when you think that's what takes you out of the zone right and uh i've observed rock bands and rappers how is it? i was like how is it that drake and little wayne were able to have such long runs and like oasis couldn't keep it together for like more than nine months or you know i but i like uh this band the darkness i was friends with back in camden back in the day and i watched darkness. them blow up love the darkness but they were i i knew them before they got known yeah and they were just always like rehearsing and playing and all their songs were amazing and they'd go out and get drunk and we'd go to parties and they'd go play and everything they did was brilliant and they were just in this zone of being the darkest play drink fight rah, 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 rah. then they get signed and then they make an album and then the record label like puts them on the road and they get out of the zone they're in this weird and when they finally got back to making another album they'd forgotten how mm -hmm. they were so out of the zone they didn't know what to do and they, they they broke up within like about three months it was just absolute chaos uh, and then i'm like how is it little wayne could just like make 200 or something records in like a year and that would seem to be getting better and better and basically what we now understand is the language of modern rap music was invented by Mo a large part of it was invented by Lil Wayne in like 2003, 2004 during this incredible period. And it's because he just stayed in the fucking zone. He did not leave. He just got into that place and he did not leave for years. And it's very noticeable when he did leave. And I remember what happened in his life that caused him to and he never got back. And I was like, all right, so what if I could get myself into the zone and then just do everything I could to not leave ever? And so I, that's what I did like three and a half years ago and I've been there ever since. So I don't think anything, I've just got myself into this place and I just keep moving. So when I finish an album, I don't go, right, okay, I'm gonna go on holiday now or whatever. I go straight into the next one. And I just keep moving like a shark. And I use synchronicities as signposts to make sure I'm going in the right way. And the more of them I see, the more I know I'm on the right path and the less maybe I need to recalibrate. And I'm in a, I'm in a constant state of recalibration to reduce anything that might get in the way of me staying in the zone or anything that might move me out of you know and i've been in that for three and a half years which is why i've been able to make um i don't know how many records but meaning wave i know on the spotify playlist the meaning wave spotify playlist which is just the stuff on spotify there's like 413 400, songs yeah. now wow. as of the, this theo von album just came out so it's, yeah. i think it's 413 this week and that was all done in three and a half years wow yeah we talked a little bit about um, the visual side earlier, and there is a big visual side to to, to sort of mean in wave. There's also there's this sort of iconography that you naturally attach with it of you know retro vibes and these certain colors. You you know pinks, purples. It's almost like I've worn this pink top on purpose, but that wasn't the case. Maybe it was a subconscious hey. choice. Um, hey. But another big <laughs> one that pops up when I when I see videos or people trying to sort of replicate um, mean in wave. Uh, sort of type tracks anime seems to be such a big um big theme i'm a big fan of anime always have been but why do you think it, it sort of provides the the perfect visuals for this type of music is it that it's sort of like a, a perfect type of escapism why do you think it provides such good visuals i yeah well that was when i said what i loved when i was a kid was music and comics anime is part of that hmm. and uh I realized the other day, very bizarrely, when I was 10 years old, I was really into anime and I lived in North Wales. And uh, you had you had manga entertainment importing anime and they had, they had Akira and uh, Urusei Yatsura, not, not Urusei Yatsura, they had like Devilman and uh, a lot of the more hardcore shit, Ninja Scroll and stuff, right? But then this other company called Anime Projects came along, licensing stuff. And uh, they had Urusei Yatsura and Bubblegum Crisis and Ranma Half, a lot of the quirkier stuff. And they were, they were based in Bangor in North Wales where I was going to school. And I used to walk down from school to this car park to go sit in my dad's car for two hours after he, while he finished lecturing at Bangor University. And literally the car park I sat in, anime projects opened opposite it. When I was 10 years old, the second manga importing company in the UK just appeared in my little Welsh town opposite where I used to sit waiting for my dad. It was just like, it was like something out of a Terry Pratchett book. <laughs> where they just fucking the shop that you need appears you know what i mean <laughs> uh so like and i always loved anime and uh obviously and you know uh 
took my name from that and all that type of shit. Mm. Uh, why it works, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's, for me, it's just the aesthetic I love. Yeah. And it's just, particularly the 80s and 90s uh, era uh, is just incredibly well drawn. And it's before, a lot of what I do is this, is this mesh between the, the contemporary futuristic and the, and the, the classic or whatever. So what I'm doing here with like the videos and stuff is I'm using contemporary like rotoscoping technology and marrying it with old analog shit. And with the same with the music, I'm taking very old techniques and marrying them with very new techniques and stuff. And it's, you want this constant balance between that, I think is, is very important. And it's also very emotionally evocative. Uh, so there's something in using that anime stuff, which, you know, hits that nostalgia thing in people, which is incredibly powerful. And it's been completely weaponized against regular humans at this point. And um, there's one thing I always say is it's very important to stay in touch with culture, keep forging new connections with new culture. Because if you get in a position where the shit that you like is only the shit that was hot when you were a kid and all that shit gets bought by Disney and Netflix, they just weaponize that against you. You know, um, aside from the fact that like there's techniques you can use like time travel and shit you can do like mentally using music you can mm -hmm. play a record that you were into when you were 10 and we capture that vibe yeah. but it'll stop working if you overuse it you know what i mean definitely if you overplay those records if you don't keep forging new connections you'll just wear out that one you won't be able to use it mm -hmm. so anyway back to your question uh anime has that nostalgic quality about it it is like technically brilliant uh also it has this quality of you being able to kind of map yourself onto it i think also part of the because it's it's foreign to us in a way uh, so if you're like watching it, uh, without subtitles, it's kind of a lot easier to kind of project yourself into it, perhaps, or get yeah. lost into it or project something else onto it. Uh, it doesn't have a solid, like, you know, the, something, something Western would not work as well because it has such defined connotations and you know exactly what it is and you know more perhaps uh what they were really talking about it or what it really meant or whatever so it's it, you know you can't as easily map it onto something that it's not related to but then you can say in the context of the Theo Von record I just did and we had some Evangelion uh visuals attached to some of those songs and it was just an absolute perfect marriage like emotionally like watching the videos the AMV aspects and just you can just I don't know it, it it had added this whole extra emotional level, uh, which wouldn't have been possible with uh, a Western equivalent somehow. We mentioned um, Jordan Peterson. You mentioned, obviously, the, the beginning of Meaning Wave. Jordan's very sort of goes hand in hand with a lot of, you know, your, your Meaning Wave tracks. I mean, you've done multiple ones with Jordan. Um, and obviously, you've, you've interviewed Jordan on, on your own podcast. Um, so you have quite a good relationship. How did that relationship begin? When was the, the first time you spoke with Jordan? Quite early. Uh, quite early, like when I put out the first, not the first track, but when I put out the first JVP Wave mix, mm. um, he saw it and tweeted it and uh, said something along the lines of, Akira the Don has obviously worked very hard on this or something like that. <laughs> Shining test. And, uh, you know. <laughs> bless him. I think his daughter had seen it first. You know, she's very plugged into the cultural stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. She interviewed Young Gravy recently. <laughs> I can't believe that. That was <laughs> such a weird worlds colliding thing. Uh, our Young Gravy was there in my studio before he did his face reveal. Like, I, I, I found him on... What did I find? I found him something where he's very... Anyway, that's a whole... That's not deviate. Uh, but that's an example of that. You know, you had people around him who were connected to cultural happenings and he saw that. And uh, I just hit him up because I wanted to make an album and I wanted to get his permission to make an album. So I emailed him and uh, to my surprise, he got straight back to me oh. and said he was very interested in what I was doing and he didn't quite understand it. And therefore it was interesting to him because yeah. he wasn't sure how to feel about it. But <laughs> he liked it, but he wasn't sure why and so on and so forth. And he was just very interested, you know. Um, yeah, so it was from it was from very early. Just because I, I reached out, and then you know I, I went to see and lecture, and uh, met his wife, and we just developed a good relationship. He had me on his podcast a couple of years ago, and we had a chat, and then he came on mine re more recently. 
Um, yeah. yeah. So, so it's just that. With Jordan Peterson, obviously you've been a you were a fan of him long before you obviously worked on the the records. What are some of your favorite sort of lessons, takeaways, or rules for life of Jordan? So what what, what sort of sticks with you from Jordan's work? And are there any ones that have had a, a big impact in your life? Yeah, well, loads. I mean, every record I do, I'm doing it because I want to integrate that into my life, right? Uh, you know, I, I want to download that Kung Fu lesson or whatever it is. Uh, so all of it has had a massive effect, like a huge effect. Uh, my life now is completely different to what it was uh, before I started this. Uh, my family's life is completely different. Uh, my capacity for... Uh, into facing with the world in a uh, in a deliberate manner and a, a manner that has effects in the in the way that I would like rather than everything just seeming random. Mm. Uh, you know, there's, there's so, so much. One of the things that I first attracted me to him was I really liked his kind of uh, breakdown, his analysis of uh, the Bible, of stories, of things of that nature. I liked his like looking at these ancient texts or old stories through a slightly, the, you know, this, yeah, this slightly evolutionary biology lens, I guess, is part, was part of it, but only part of it. And I liked all that stuff. More than the political stuff, I was less interested in the political stuff and continue to be, it's everywhere. And it's, you know, I've been, I've been observing the current sort of polit politicization of everything wave. It started in the comic book industry and in, at the end of 2012. So the stuff that's now infected everything, start, I, I, I observed that making itself known in the, in the comic book world at the end of 2012, mm. when we began this new seven year cultural cycle that we have every seven years. And that started at the end of 2012, um, where it started to sort of bubble up and then it kicked in in 2013. But anyway, it was, but with Peterson, a lot of people found Peterson because of the uh, political stuff, but it wasn't that that was, and I always feel with him, it kind of annoys me that he's had to spend so much of his time dealing with that stuff. Uh, and so many, so many great minds, I feel, have been engaged in just ridiculous arguments about stuff that we figured out thousands of years ago. And uh, it's frustrating, you know, because we could have, uh, we could be so much further along in so many areas that are more important. But we're constantly, our, our best minds are constantly being dragged into the gutter by these morons uh but anyway the, the, the core messages of peterson uh you know self-responsibility uh the uh you know the what acceptance of the nature of reality and what to do about it picking up you know the heaviest rock you can find type vibes mm -hmm. uh the acceptance of the suffering aspect of life and then turning that into something useful uh the yeah so much of it so much mm. of it. it's interesting you mentioned that about um these sort of great minds getting bogged down with these conversations that we don't need to waste our time on because we've spoken to so many like great minds on this show a big example is probably brett weinstein probably one of the you know the the, the, the smartest people i've ever spoken to and you know you can put out an episode or a few clips with brett and it's not the sort of you know, the, the evolutionary biology stuff that he talks about, all this great stuff he talks about that, that sort of bangs is when you put out a clip that's of him <laughs> talking about something political. Why do you think, you know, people are just, they just seem to be drawn to that sort of stuff more than anything? Yeah, because people like drama. People are hardwired for drama. Yeah. Peterson, I said this when he first came out, he was very smart. He used the same technique as 50 Cent uh, when he came out uh, to get big. And it's continued to use it, uh, which is the drama thing principle, right? You get yourself into a big drama. People like drama. They look at the drama. And then, you know, 50, in 50 Cent's case, it was like, oh, I've got a shot at, oh, I'm getting it. He's getting into beefs with different rappers every day. He's starting fights every day, right? And then people go to him, but they were like, oh, this guy's got fucking like eight mixtapes and they're fire. You know, so that's how, despite having got dropped by a couple record labels and shit, 50 Cent got himself popping. Uh, various people have utilized similar tactics and uh, Peterson did that to great effect. Uh, you know, it get, gets in insane drama seemingly every fucking week. It's like a mini drama every week and then a tentpole drama every season type <laughs> thing, right? 
And uh, but then people go to him and then he's got this YouTube channel full of all this epic work. And it's like, oh, shit, fucking Bible lectures are oh, breaking down what Genesis means through a kind of evolutionary biology type lens. Oh, this is fire. Oh, shit. You know, yeah. uh, so that's what would happen there. Right. People love drama. Everybody knows that it's a fundamental thing in life. People, uh, you know, whether it's gladiatorial combat, whether it's, uh, you know, people just laughing at people falling over, or getting hit by rocks. It is in the human nature to be attracted to that kind of thing. And if you're, uh, if you're savvy, and uh, then you will use that to your advantage. And uh, that's basically how fucking, how YouTube works, right? It certainly is, man. Um, now, I, mean, I don't do it. I yeah. stayed away from it. I could have, I've been, had the opportunity to get into all sorts of shit, but I do not wish to tarnish the work because I'm working with so many other people's shit. With, sure. And I don't want to be tarnishing uh you know alan watts's legacy or whatever because no kira the don got into fucking internet beef with such <laughs> and such a person so while i'm fully aware of how that works and how powerful it is and how easily i could utilize it i refrain from utilizing it uh and i'm taking the kind of you know build it and they will come approach uh but you know peterson used it very well but also it's it's fire baby because uh you know you saw what happened with peterson it's a dangerous thing to do and once you walk into that arena and you start using those tools, you start using those little magic tricks, like you have to suffer the consequences. You can't have one without the other. And he has suffered the consequences of uh, opening up that Pandora's box, you know, and continues to. Luckily, he, he, you know, he's very strong and he has a wonderful family around him. But Jesus, you know, uh, you've, seen, you've seen what's happened. Yeah. You see what happens with, look what, I mean, it happens 50 Cent. You know, uh, DJ Khaled took the approach of being friends with everybody. He was like an early podcaster. He's like, you know, a podcaster, you get such and such a person on your podcast and then you get some of their viewers and so on. And sure. You build that way, right? Uh, rather than starting a big drama every day. That's one <laughs> way of doing it. DJ Khaled, he did the, he was like an early podcaster. Get, get every rapper on the track. Each track has got three verses. That's three rappers. Mm -hmm. That's three audiences. And now DJ Khaled is still massive. He's still a massive music artist and 50 Cent can't make records anymore. You know, for sure, man. Look, you we mentioned Jordan there, but you've had conversations with some of yeah, the, I mean, the world's most respected intellectuals. I mean, like Jordan, but also Naval Ravikant. Um, what have conversations like that done for you personally? I imagine your IQ, IQ flies up every time you speak to one of those guys. <laughs> it's it's really enjoyable to speak with uh, people who know what they're talking about, right? <laughs> For sure, uh, you, 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 I'm sure you feel it yourself, right? Steel sharp and steel and all that sort of thing. And, and uh, you rise to the occasion. You know, the whole thing about you are the sum of the people you're closest to is very, very true. If you hang around with a bunch of, uh, you know, drunk morons, then you're going to be a drunk moron. Uh, it doesn't matter how, whatever you, you know. Uh, that's why it's epic these days because you can choose who the people closest to you are. You can just like listen to your podcast. You know, sure. you could just go, OK, I'm going to listen to the Jocko podcast and I'm going to listen to Brett Weinstein or whatever that flip it is. And you be those are the conversations you're privy to. But then engaging with them yourself, that's a whole different level, because then you're actually having to prove that you know what you think, you know, you can wander around in your head all day thinking you're smart and thinking you know shit. But until you actually have to say it or write it down, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn Spanish right now. Uh, I'm using this Duolingo thing. And I yeah. sit there and I do the lessons and I'm brilliant. But then I go out to a cafe and try and speak it. It's, it's really hard. You need to be practicing. You need to be actually speaking. You need to be yeah. actually engaging in, in interactions, in dialect. Otherwise, you don't really know anything. No. You forget it. That's part of where I do the meaning wave thing. Because uh, you listen to a podcast and you're like, oh, yeah, that's epic. And you think you know it. But if you don't integrate it into your life, you will forget it. And then you'll find yourself listening to a podcast three years later that's got the same information in it and you think you're getting it. No. So if you don't find ways to integrate these ideas into your life, and integrate the disciplines or integrate the, the modes of being or the principles or whatever it is, they will evaporate like tears in the rain, you know? So anyway, going back to your question, having conversations with people like Naval is, is joyful and epic and it also really does kind of make you uh, make these things that's, that are ideas real. So you're actually saying, you know, actually saying the thing and actually understanding it in a course of a flowing conversation makes it real. So bringing it back to, to Meaning Wave, um, 
I can, there's a certain sort of corner of the internet that you know will appreciate that sort of things. Like, you know that someone who appreciates Jocko is probably going to appreciate a Theo Vaughn. They're probably going to appreciate Rogan Peterson. There's that sort of type of person that will that is drawn to that. But I wonder what your sort of experience has been like with the mainstream media. Have they reacted to Meaning Wave in any way? What is your, what is your experience? Do, they, do you think that they would appreciate Meaning Wave? No, they pretend it doesn't exist. Okay. Yeah, that's their edge. It's funny because I, before I was doing Meaning Wave, I was, you know, doing the music I was doing and the music industry covered me quite a lot. I had yeah. quite a lot of press. Uh, since Meaning Wave, nothing. Mm. But I'm getting way, way more people are listening to it, to this music, <laughs> than when listening to the previous music. Uh, if you look at, say, what the enemy is writing about this week, uh, whatever that is. I did this as an experiment a few months ago just to check if it was the case. And it was the case that what they were writing about and the people they were writing about had a fraction of the listeners the, the weaker. Yeah. But since I started doing this, boom, nothing. Those like enemy used to write about me. All these different people used to write about what I was doing. But since Meaning Wave, this position completely gone. I had a few people write to me and uh, accuse me of being an istophobe. Be like, I can't believe you're doing this. Disavow. And be like, sort of threatened to some weirdo start threatening my family and shit. It was quite strange. Oh. Um, but yeah, like they really don't want uh, people to be disciplined. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Like, <laughs> they really don't want people self-actualizing. I don't know. What it is, you know, you know what it is, is that uh, people have been told that some of these people are bad and anyone who associates with people who have been deemed bad in the way our modern society works, there must also be bad. And you must disassociate. And if you do not disassociate and disavow, that means you're bad as well, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but they also understand that, uh, that they're better off ignoring it for as long as they can, rather than giving it the grain, any grain of, uh, of publicity for various reasons. Because they'll sit there and write like, oh, why doesn't certain kinds of music exist? And why don't people talk about certain stuff and this, that, and the other? And it does exist. They just choose not to cover it because of ideological possession reasons. But we don't need them, you know. We don't need them anymore. That's the thing, and I've been saying this for 20 years. Yeah. It, it, it is interesting because I think of John, I think it's a good social experiment. If you start taking, you know, start being vocal about that you're interested in the works of, you know, these guys in the intellectual dark web, if, if you want to label it that. But I remember when I first bought... 12 rules for life by jordan peterson i just put a picture of it on my instagram story and someone i went to school with <laughs> i know bad idea right someone i went to school with messaged me and they said i cannot believe you're reading that book and i said i said i, I mean i wasn't too clued up on jordan at the time i was just i just liked the title I said, what's so wrong about the book? They said, oh, it's an, it's an evil book. Um, people read it and they turn into a, a you know, right, right wing lunatics. And I started reading it. I was thinking, oh, okay. So chapter one, um, stand up straight with your shoulders back. I mean, that's not really a, a right wing uh, ideology, is it? But yeah, you're right, man. People just, they hear <laughs> these people are bad and all of a sudden they don't want to hear anything about them. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I started with Peterson. Maybe if I'd start, because I, I have people who, who get into meaning waves through, say, the Alan Watts stuff, and they really love that. And then sometimes they'll hit me up and be like, oh my goodness, like I'll then listen to this Peterson record and it really makes sense and it really resonates with me. And I, I was told he was a bad guy, you know, da, 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 da. So it works in that regard. You know, again, that's why I, I stay away from politics and so on and so forth. Some of the people that, whose words we integrate have these political affiliations or, or not affiliations, uh, 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 perceptions. But yeah, but then some people will be like, oh, Akira the Dawn's completely destroyed Alan Watts for me. Because uh, then they just find the Peterson stuff or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, but it's that it works with some people is great. Hmm. You know, that it allows some people to escape the ideological plantation hmm. is wonderful. It's, yeah, um... I, remember I was, I had someone hit me up from who was a musician that I worked with, who, uh, you know, quite well known musician that I've done some stuff with. And he's like, you do understand that. Jordan Peterson is considered to be an alt-right, like gateway, this, that, and the other. And uh, 
you know, I want to want, he was like, he was trying to be nice. He's like, you know, you might want to like not do that because I don't, I don't think you understand what it means. Like you will be blacklisted. <laughs> you, people are not going to talk to you anymore. I won't be able to be associated with you anymore. Wow. Like, you do understand. I was like, thank you very much for a good sir. I was like, you know, <laughs> he isn't the things that you say. And if you read the work for more than three minutes, you'll understand that, I'm sure. But it's, people are scared nowadays, you know. Sure. It's crazy, man. Like, obviously, I mentioned Dave Rubin earlier. When I spoke to Dave Rubin, I literally say in, in the video, Dave, I, my political views don't align with your own. Um, I don't agree with what you've said, but they, yet I still got emails threatening me. I, you know, say, you know, people trying to report my videos. And, and I'm just, I didn't, even, I didn't even agree with the guy, but just because I had a conversation with the guy, people yeah, don't want to know. Platform. I know. Yeah, because that's the thing they've been taught is uh, you don't debate, you don't argue, you don't. Uh, sunlight is not the best disinfectant. Uh, <laughs> that's why they are so into destroying people and tearing them down and all that. Their whole thing is just like do not engage, mm. uh, and that's because their ideas are shit. You know, if their <laughs> ideas were, were good or thought, well, not maybe it's shit. Some of them, maybe some of them are good, but they haven't yeah. thought them through. No. You know, they haven't thought them through because when you engage with them, a lot of the time. They haven't gone to that end, the, the natural conclusion of the idea. Because mm. the natural conclusion of the idea oftentimes is, is genocide, you know? And that's what's really kind of concerning about right now is that certain ideas which are, are trendy amongst certain people that are being proliferated and are not being challenged because they're not allowed to stand up to scrutiny because the people won't debate, and they won't interact. And they'll say that if you talk to someone with an opposing viewpoint, you're a bad person. Uh, the end point of these ideas is mass murder, as Leonard Cohen predicted on the future. I've seen the future, brother. It is murder. Uh, you know, that's, and that's what's the irony of the piece. Thing is he spent 40 years of how it was that people allowed the brutal and murderous events of the 20th century to uh, national socialism happen. How did communism happen? Uh, how did Mao happen? How, and so forth. And like, and they say he <laughs> like say he's the bad guy for trying to go. Hey, you guys, uh, this thing leads to this thing, and that's going to be pretty bad. It's like, shut up. It's the it's the guy. He's like, yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty epic times. It's pretty epic stuff. <laughs> but you know the old uh, adage. You know you're going in the right direction in the video game when enemies appear. Mm. you know I love that. so if you, you know it is so you, you're doing the right thing i have two final quick questions for you the first one for those listening right now who they've listened to the conversation but they've never heard of meaning wave they've, they've never heard of that type of music if you could just recommend them one record from meaning wave one song one piece of music what would you point them to to introduce them to the genre oh, the latest album is good the latest yeah. album was great. Uh, the the new album is a record with Theo Vaughn, and uh, it's a beautiful record. It's a banger. It's got epic anthems on it. It's about how he uh, became sober. Mm. It's about how he went from you know being a kind of uh, a poor, sad, scared kid to uh, a kind of comedy superstar and. Uh, got really into drugs and shit, and then how he managed to get out of that stuff. Mm. You know, it's very relatable. It's uh, very, very sad. It's very joyful. It's very beautiful. You know, uh, I, would never, I, couldn't have, I couldn't pick any one record because each individual is going to have a record that works for them best. Yeah. You might maybe want to hit shuffle on the Meaning Wave playlist on Spotify or, or your streaming platform of choice. Uh, you know, it depends what you're into. You know, if you, if you want some motivational... Uh, Workout type music. There's a gang of that shit with Jocko and Joe Rogan and David Goggins and people like that. If you want uh, some like metaphysical considerations, one thing you could do is go to the YouTube and pick a mixtape that is themed on a topic you're interested in. We have a lot of that kind of thing. We just dropped one called The Shadow, which is about Young's idea of the shadow, mm. you know, but through the lens of the anime Berserk, you know, which is dope. Awesome. 
some, some some good suggestions there for everyone to check out. The last question I have for you today, we ask every guest. It could be anything. It could be family. It could be friends. It could be your music. It could be whatever you like. But for Akira the Don right now, what makes a life worth living? Living. Hmm. <laughs> but, you know, it, it is. It's to live. You know, many people, uh, everybody dies, but not everybody lives. You know, and if you're, uh, and, uh, like, that's a, it takes, you know, who was it? Was it Socrates or someone? I know, you know, it takes a lifetime to learn how to die. But some people will get to that point and, and never have worked out how to live in the first place. If you spend in your whole time worrying about what other people think or scared of shit or fucking believing the news or whatever it is, like, and, you ain't living. If you spend your time worrying about what's happened coming up in the future or regretting things that happened in the past, you ain't living. It takes a long time to work out, like to learn how to exist in the moment and actually live, you know? And when you do that, it's an incredible thing. It took me decades to really, I had flashes of it. I was doing it, I was doing it. And then I'd get sucked in, you know, you go. Uh, so yeah, that's what makes life worth living is, is actually working out how to do it and then doing it and then when you do it and then you do it on a consistent basis things just become more and more magical and more and more things unlock and the more you can do it and the more you can unlock the more shimmering and glorious things become and you just start to see the, how things really are and that's how things really are things really are glorious and uh, that seems to be hidden from a lot of us it's bizarre right we live at this point where there has never been more abundance and potential for the regular person yet simultaneously people have never been more kind of alone and depressed and confused and you know in 200 episodes that's probably one of my favorite answers to that question man i really appreciate you uh, bringing the value on that question so for all our audience where can they find more on you where can they find you online where can they connect with the key of the dawn i think wherever they are they'll be able to find us like you know is with the internet these days uh, yeah if you it's like la if you're in burbank you're not necessarily going to go to hollywood or whatever so we try and exist wherever you may be so if you're a person who likes youtube we're on youtube if you're on spotify we're on spotify uh if you're on twitter or whatever we're there uh wherever you might be look up akira the dawn look up meaning wave you'll find something awesome akira the dawn thank you so much for joining me today it's been an absolute pleasure my friend hey appreciate you brother thank you for your time